Hello, friends. My name is Daniel Fontenot, and welcome to Jewels of Truth. Let us pray and ask the Lord to guide us as we study His Word. Our great and holy Father in heaven, O Lord, we thank you for the book of Revelation. We thank you for thy Holy Spirit, which has been promised to us, and we claim the promise, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And so, Father, we believe the time is at hand, when the end of all things is come, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will appear in the clouds of heaven to redeem his people. And so, Father, we pray that as we study the book of Revelation, that you would continue to guide us by your Holy Spirit, give us wisdom and understanding that we may rightly divide thy word of truth. Thank you, dear Father, for hearing and granting our request. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome again to Jewels of Truth. Today's presentation is entitled The Seven Spirits of God. And so we read in uh, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. When I was studying this, I got a lot more information than what I had uh, thought I was going to get. There's a lot more on this, and I did not by any means exhaust it. Of course, you can't exhaust any subject in the Scriptures. You cannot do it. it. It is impossible. But we are instructed that we are to search and to dig as much as we possibly can. Uh, there was a lot of information, even from the pioneers, People like A.T. Jones, E.J. Wagner, J. N. Loughborough, um, uh, J. N. Andrews, and others. So um, I hope this will be a blessing to all. So in there are several places in the scriptures in which the seven spirits of God are mentioned, and they they are all, I believe, in the Book of Revelation. So, uh, Revelation, you have, we already read Re Revelation 1, verse 4, and Revelation 3, 1 tells us, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Revelation 4, 5, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So the seven uh, lamps of fire, they are the seven spirits of God. Revelation 5, 6, And behold, I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So there even the scriptures tell us and define what the seven spirits are. Now, the number seven is, uh, how should I say, it's, it, has a, it plays a role in understanding what the seven spirits are and what is their work, what do they do. The number seven uh, indicates completeness. I just took a part of a statement from the book, The Acts of the Apostles, page 585. There's a lot more to it than that. In, that, in the context of that statement, she's, she's, Ellen White is speaking about uh, the, uh, the, the letters to the churches. But I just wanted just to zero in on just that one part of that statement, which says simply, the number seven indicates completeness. Christ object lessons, page 243, tells us, uh, Peter had come to Christ with the question, how oft shall, I, shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? The rabbis limited the ex exercise of forgiveness to three offenses. Peter, carrying out, as he supposed, the teaching of Christ, thought, it, thought to extend it to seven. 
the number signifying perfection. So there you have the number seven not only is, uh, indicates completeness, but it also signifies perfection, completeness and perfection. Uh, in manuscript releases, another one, uh, volume four, page 243, uh, Christ fulfilled still another feature of the type. His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. In the temple service, when the animal brought as a sacrifice was slain, the high priest, clothed in white robes, caught in his hand the blood that gushed forth, and cast it in the direction of the tabernacle or temple. This was done seven times as an expression of perfection. So there you have another witness that number seven uh, represents perfection. Uh, so, so it's perfection and completeness. So here you have, we're going to kind of switch gears here. Uh, we have several verses that speak of the eyes of the Lord, okay? So because I say eyes, I emphasize the word eyes, because uh, the seven spirits have eyes, as we read there in uh, Revelation 5, 6. Again, if you go back to there, near the top of page 1 of the notes there, Revelation 5, 6, uh, and, I, and I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So this is, this is again going, this is explaining what do the seven spirits of God do? What do they accomplish? And what do they represent? We already know they rep represent perfection and completeness. Second Chronicles 16, 9, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro through out the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward them. Now, we'll bring this out again later in this study, but the fact that the number seven indicates completeness and perfection, this is not, I mean, this is most assuredly the Holy Spirit. You know, the seven spirits are the Holy Spirit. But the number seven is just simply telling us that the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, okay? Omnipresent. He, uh, he completely, his eyes completely overview the earth and the e events. And uh, anyway, we'll, we'll just keep on going here because as we go, as we continue in this study, you'll understand better what I'm talking about here. So the eyes of the Lord, they run to and, thro to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. So the Lord is looking down on the earth, okay? The Holy Spirit is, ev is everywhere and he's looking upon the inhabitants of the earth, and he's looking, he sh he's looking for those whose heart is perfect toward him. Zechariah 4.10 tells us, For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice, and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel, and with those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Okay, the number seven represents completeness and perfection. He's looking over all the earth, through the whole earth, okay? Completeness, whole, being synonymous. Psalm 11, verse 4, the Lord is in his holy temple, the Lord's throne is in heaven, his eyes behold, his eyelids cry the children of men. So he sees everything that's going on over the whole earth, the complete earth. Psalm 33, 18, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him and upon them that hope in his mercy. Psalm 34, 15, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cry. Okay, 
He sees and he hears everything. He hears the righteous. He hears their cries. Uh, Proverbs 5.21 For the eyes of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his going. There you have the word all there. Proverbs 15.3 The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Proverbs 22, verse 12, The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, and he overthroweth the words of the transgressor. Amos 9, verse 8, Behold, the eyes of the Lord are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from, the, from off the face of the earth, saying, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. This is what Amos 9, 8 here is saying is the same thing that, that, that God says in other portions of, his, of the scriptures, like in, uh, I think, is, uh, Jeremiah chapter 25, where it speaks of the judgment upon the world, upon all the kingdoms of the, of the, of the, uh, of the world. Uh, and he will punish them, and he will also punish his people, okay, but he will not utterly destroy his people, okay? Because he's looking, he's looking at every person, and he's, he's judging every case individually. 1 Peter 3, verse uh, 12, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Okay, so here is a passage from the book Christian Experience and Teaching of Ellen G. White, um, page 187. The, the crisis is fast approaching. And my, how we can see that today, as never before. The crisis is fast approaching. The time of God's visitation has about come. The word visitation has a, ha, plays a big role in this subject also in regards to the eyes of the Lord, the staring spirits of the Lord looking over the over all the earth. And I hope we don't. We're not. I hope no one here here gets the um, gets the idea that there are actually seven Holy Spirits. But I'm not saying that. The Bible does not say that. Okay? The number seven is just indicating the completeness and the perfection of the Holy Spirit as he, he, he is all-knowing. Okay? Those who walk, and of course, and he comes to, vi there is a time, this, the time of God's visitation plays a prominent role in the Scriptures. Although loath to punish, nevertheless he will punish, and that speedily. Those who walk in the light will see signs of the approaching peril. Do you see signs of the approaching peril? But they are not to sit in quiet, unconcerned expectancy of the ruin, comforting themselves with the belief that God will shelter his people in the day of visitation. Far from it. They should realize that it is their duty to labor diligently to save others, looking with strong faith to God for help. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James 5.16 The leaven of godliness has not entirely lost its power. At the time when the danger and depression of the church are greatest, okay, and, and it is not at its greatest right now, but it will soon be at its greatest. The little company who are standing in the light will be sighing and crying for all the abominations that are done in the land. But more especially, will their prayers arise in behalf of the church because its members are doing after the manner of the world. The earnest prayers of this faithful few will not be in vain. Notice, when the Lord comes forth as an avenger, 
he will also come as a protector of all those who have preserved the faith in its purity and kept themselves unspotted from the world. It is at this time, the time when the Lord comes forth as an avenger, that God has promised to avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. This will be a time when the church of God will be crying day and night. Okay? And he will come as a protector of all those who have preserved the faith in its purity and kept themselves unspotted from the world. The day of God's vengeance is just upon us. The seal of God will be placed upon the foreheads of those only who sigh and cry for the abominations done in the land. Those who link in sympathy with the world are eating and drinking with the drunken and will surely be destroyed with the workers of iniquity. Notice now, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So, when the Lord comes forth as an avenger during the Sunday law crisis, his eyes are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry, but his face is against them that do evil. They that do evil are those who receive the mark of the beast. Now, just to hopefully clarify things even more here, when we read in the book of Revelation, this, we are, these verses that we're studying today in Revelation 1 and verse 4, when we read that it says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. When he mentions the seven spirits which are before his throne, he's, he's looking, God is looking far out into the future. When the seven spirits which go over all the earth, because the number seven represents completeness and perfection. It goes all over the earth, and he's looking for those who are serving him and those who are and deciding who are the ones that are serving him, those that are sighing and crying for all the abominations that be done in the land, and those who are following after the world. This is what the spirit seven this is why the, this is at least one of the reasons why the whole the, the, the seven spirits are mentioned here. And here's another passage here from um, Prophets and Kings 376. After quoting Isaiah 61 through 4 and verse 10 and 11 and chapter 45, verse 22, the servant, the messenger of the Lord tells us these prophecies of a great spiritual awakening in a time of gross darkness are today meeting fulfillment in the advancing lines of mission stations that are reaching out into the benighted regions of the earth. The groups of missionaries in heathen lands have been likened by the prophet to ensigns set up for the guidance of those who are looking for the light of truth. In that day, says Isaiah, there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcast of Israel, and, and gather together the, the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Notice, the day of deliverance is at hand. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. This is the eyes of the Lord. These are the eyes of, of the Lord which belong to the seven spirits of Revelation 1 verse 4. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout all, throughout the whole earth. See, and his running, 
He, the Holy Spirit is running to and fro, to and fro, looking this way and that way. Just like if you would be looking, say if, you're, say if you've lost something on the grass, like I do sometimes, I'll, I'll, I'll lose a nail or a screw whenever I'm working on, on building something, or just any kind of an item that you may have lost, and you are, are in your house, and you're looking, where is this, th- you're looking, where is this thing, and your eyes are looking to and fro, okay? Well, that's just a small, very small example, of course, of the Holy Spirit looking to and fro in all the earth, throughout the whole earth, and showing himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Among all nations, kindreds, tongues, among all nations, kindreds and, kindreds and tongues, he sees men and women who are praying for light and knowledge. Their souls are unsatisfied. Long have they fed on ashes. See Isaiah 44, 20. The enemy of all righteousness has turned them aside, and they grope as blind men, but they are honest in heart and desire to learn a better way, although in the depths of heathenism, with no knowledge of the written law of God, nor of his son Jesus, they have revealed in manifold ways the working of a divine power on mind and character. Proverbs in Kings 3.76. You know, whenever I read here of people that are in the depths of heathenism, I think of Hindus, um, Buddhists, all kinds of heathen religions, but I also think of Catholics, okay? They are in the depths of heathenism with no knowledge of the written law of God. Now, you, you might make an exception as far as that, the written law of God is concerned, but do they know who Jesus is? They don't know who Jesus is any more uh, than what the Catholic priests tell them of, of, of Jesus Christ. They, so, they, they know so little of Jesus that they think that uh, Mary, his mother, is their co-redemptress. Okay? If that's not in the depths of heathenism, I don't know what is. But God is looking for them. God is looking among these people to see whose heart is perfect towards him. They're looking for, for light and knowledge. They're praying for light and knowledge. They're groping as blind men. The enemy of all righteousness, working through priests and pastors, have turned them aside. Okay? And God is looking for them. The seven spirits of God, the completeness of God, is looking for them. It is during the Sunday law crisis that the day of deliverance is at hand. Then the eyes of the Lord will run to and fro throughout the earth and set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. He will gather them from the four corners of the earth. And there again, the four corners of the earth. God's all-seeing eye, the number seven, perfection, completeness. The four corners of the earth, that means over all the earth. Uh, Review and Herald, January 11th, 1912. Let us ever bear in mind that our work is to be one of advancement. We are to follow on to know the Lord. God understands the actuating principle of every mind. He has witnessed the persistent, rebellious course of some whom he has warned and counseled. His all-seeing eye, you know, you think of, Usually when people think of the all-seeing eye, they think of the dollar bill, okay? The all-seeing eye. That's a counterfeit. It's nonsense. You know, yeah, you, you have these globalists and the Jesuits, they seem to be all-seeing, don't they? Especially today with, with today's uh, technology, okay? They're nothing compared to what the Holy Spirit does, okay? God, the Holy Spirit knows the intents and the actions and the thoughts of every heart of every human being that's ever lived upon the face of this earth. 
His all-seeing eye has noted the determined following of human principles. Yes, he knows, God knows also the motives which prompt every action. The eyes of man are before the eyes, um, the, the ways of man, rather, are before the eyes of the Lord. He knoweth the thoughts. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. He knoweth, he looketh to the ends of the earth, and seeth under the whole heaven, the Lord searcheth all hearts. Again, this goes back to the number seven, completeness, perfection. That was Review and Herald, January 11th, 1912. Uh, Manuscript Releases, Volume 13, page 311. The Lord God is exact and infallible in his comprehension. He understands the working of the human mind, the active principles of the human agents he has formed, just how they will be moved upon by the objects that come before them and in what manner they will act under every temptation that can try them and in every circumstance in which they are placed. The ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. He looketh to the ends of the earth, and seeth under the whole heavens. The Lord searcheth all hearts, and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. He knows the things that come into our minds, every one of them. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and opened under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Again, emphasizing the importance and the signification of that number seven in the seven spirits of God. Okay, so you have here the definitions, uh, or the definition, because... All three of those words, all, every, and whole, which are found in Proverbs 21, verse 5, 15, verse 3, and Job 28, verse 24. All, all of these words, all, every, and whole, they have, the, it's all the same meaning. And uh, it means the whole, all, every, okay, and uh, also complete, Perfect, okay, the word complete and perfect there, representing the statements that we read earlier in the Spirit of Prophecy. The number seven indicates completeness, Acts of the Apostles 585, and the number seven signifying perfection, Christ Object Lessons 243. Now here is a uh, passage here from um, the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, March 19th, 1857. Uh, I forgot to put the name of the person who wrote this statement. Uh, I think it was uh, J.N. Loughborough, and he says, and there were a lot. You, you can go to the CD-ROM and you can look up, you just type in the words, uh, uh, the seven spirits of God, okay, or the seven spirits, <clears throat> and you will, you will find a lot of information from the, from the pioneers on this subject. I just chose one, because the notes would have been too long have, had I, and the presentation, therefore, would have been too long had I put all of them in these notes. Uh, seven, he says, is a number used many times in the book of Revelation. Inspiration has seemingly selected it as a number which signifies the whole of that to which it is applied. It's the number seven signifies the whole of that to which it is applied. So it is, it is applied in various ways. That whole, be, that whole being divided into seven parts, either a, applying to seven different periods and a work accomplished in those periods or to seven different manifestations of the one thing spoken of. The seven spirits of God are spoken of in Revelation 1 verse 4, 3 verse 1, 4 verse 5, and 5 verse 6. And yet, the Spirit of God is definitely spoken of in other portions of Scripture as one Spirit. So, all these worketh that one and self Spirit. Okay, all these worketh that one and self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. 
The seven spirits of God probably refer to seven different manifestations of that spirit. In several instances where the number seven is used, it applies to a series of events to transpire in consecutive order during seven different periods. The seven angels with their seven trumpets and the seven seals are instances where it occurs in that manner. That's a lot to chew on right there. Uh, Review and Herald, March 9th, 1897. The servant of the Lord says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is essential that every subject of the kingdom of God should be obedient to the law of God, in order that his infinite glory may have a perfect establishment. The professed followers of Christ are tested in this life to see whether or not they will be obedient to God. Obedience will result in happiness and will ensure the reward of eternal life. Failure on the part of Adam on one point resulted in terrible consequences, and sin was grown, has grown to such vast proportions that it cannot be measured. But in the midst of rebellion and apostasy, in the midst of those who were dis, disloyal, impenitent, and obstinate, the Lord looks down, God looks down, upon those who love him and keep his commandments and says, I love them that love me, and I will cause them to inherit substance. I will render vengeance to mine enemies and will reward them that hate me. So when God looks down upon those, he looks, he look, in, in the midst, let's say, let's say it this way, in the midst of rebellion and apostasy, okay, he's looking down, God looks down, and he sees in the midst of rebellion and apostasy, in the midst of those who were disloyal, impenitent, and obstinate, he looks down upon those who love him and keep his commandments. Okay? Okay, now from uh, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 234. A profession of religion has become popular with the world. Rulers... Politicians, lawyers, doctors, merchants join the church as a means of securing the respect and confidence of society and advancing their own worldly interests. Thus they seek to cover all their unrighteous transactions under a profession of Christianity. But the Lord knows all about it. The various religious bodies, enforced by the wealth and influence of these baptized worldlings, make a still higher bid for popularity and patronage. Splendid churches, embellished in the most extravagant manner, are erected on popular avenues. The worshippers array themselves in costly and fashionable attire. The, a high salary is paid for a talented minister to entertain and attract the people. His sermons must not touch popular sins, but be made smooth and pleasing for fashionable ears. Thus, fashionable sinners are enrolled on the church books, and fashionable sins are concealed under a pretense of godliness. God looks down upon these apostate bodies and declares them daughters of a harlot. To secure the favor and support of the great men of earth, they have broken their solemn vows of allegiance and fidelity to the King of Heaven. Again, that's Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 234. The, the seven spirits of God, they look upon these apostate bodies and declare them daughters of a harlot. Okay, the last portion of this study is a long passage from the Great Controversy, page 312 to 316. I wanted to put this in this study because to me, this is a perfect illustration, as if we are, haven't already had perfect illustrations, but I believe that this is a very good il illustration of um, the seven spirits of God, even though it does not mention the seven spirits of God, in this passage, 
considering what we have already learned that the that that the seven spirits of God go, uh, they go they go to and fro throughout all the earth to see whose heart is perfect towards God and those who are following after the world and are rebelling against him this is an example of that this is in the chapter this comes from the chapter in great controversy um, I can't remember the name of the, the chapter here. Oh, I'll just we'll open right up to it. Heralds of the morning. Heralds of the morning. That's a miracle. <laughs> the Lord just, okay, open right up to the chapter. This big, thick book here. Um, so this is, and I've mentioned this to you before, uh, this, the cha this is the chapter just before the chapter that begins to tell the history of uh, the Millerite movement. Okay, so it says, Faithful men who were, who were obedient to the promptings of God's Spirit and the teachings of His Word were to proclaim this warning to the world, that me meaning the three angels' messages. They were those who had taken heed to the sure word of prophecy, the light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise. They have been seeking the knowledge, they had been seeking the knowledge of God more than all hid treasures, counting it better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. And the Lord revealed to them the great things of the kingdom. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. It was not the scholarly theologians who had an understanding of this truth and engaged in its proclamation. Had these been faithful watchmen, diligently and prayerfully searching the scriptures, they would have known the time of night. The prophecies would have opened to them the events about to take place. But they did not occupy this position, and the message was given by humbler men. Said Jesus, Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. Those who turn away from the light which God has given are who neglect to seek it when it is within their reach are left in darkness. But the Savior declares, He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Whoever is with singleness of purpose seeking to do God's will, earnestly heeding the light already given, will receive greater light. To that soul some star of heavenly radiance will be sent to guide him into all truth. At the time of Christ's first advent, at the time of Christ's first advent, the priests and scribes of the holy city to whom were entrusted the oracles of God, might have discerned the signs of the times and proclaimed the coming of the promised one. The prophecy of Micah designated his birthplace. Daniel specified the time of his advent. God committed these prophecies to the Jewish leaders. They were without excuse if they did not know and declare to the people that the Messiah's coming was at a hand. Their ignorance was the result of sinful neglect. The Jews were building monuments for the slain prophets of God, while by their deference to the great men of earth, they were paying homage to the servants of Satan. And this is something that I have recognized for years. Among, even among our own church, among Seventh-day Adventists, they build the monuments of Ellen White. Yes. While by their deference to the great men of earth, okay, they pay deference, I'm sorry, they, they, they defer to the great men of earth. And they are paying, and while they're doing this, they are paying homage to the servants of Satan. Okay, when you defer, you're saying, you know, you have the preeminence, okay? Seventh-day Adventist church leaders, they will defer to uh, the, the leaders of the UN. They will defer to American presidents, okay? And in doing so, 
They are paying homage to the servants of Satan. And of course, you know, Seventh-day Adventist leaders are not the only ones doing this, okay? You have the Catholic Church doing this. You have the Protestant churches doing this. You know, they've been doing, doing this for years. But Seventh-day Adventists have no excuse to be doing this, okay? Absorbed in their ambitious strife for place and power among men, they lost sight of the divine honors proffered them by the King of Heaven. <clears throat> With profound and reverent interest, the elders of Israel should have been studying the place, the time, the circumstances of the greatest event in the world's history, the coming of the Son of God to accomplish the redemption of man. All the people should have been watching and waiting that they might be among the first to welcome the world's Redeemer. But lo, at Bethlehem, two weary travelers from the hills of Nazareth traveled the whole length of the narrow street to the eastern extremity of the town, vainly seeking a place of rest and shelter for the night. No doors are open to receive them. In a wretched hovel prepared for cattle, they at last find refuge, and there the Savior of the world is born. Do you think that the eyes of the Lord were upon these two weary travelers, Joseph and Mary? Heavenly angels had seen the glory which the Son of God shared with the Father before the world was, and they had looked forward with intense interest to his appearing on earth as an event fraught with the greatest joy to all people. Angels were appointed to carry the glad tidings to those who were prepared to receive it and who, were, and, and, and who would joyfully make it known to the inhabitants of the earth. Again, do you think that, this, that the seven spirits of God were directing those angels to carry the glad tidings to those who were prepared to receive it? and who would joyfully make it known to the inhabitants of the earth? Christ had, stooped, Christ had stooped to take upon himself man's nature. He was to bear an infinite weight of woe as he should make his soul an offering for sin. Yet angels desired that even in his humiliation the Son of the Highest might appear before men with a dignity and glory befitting his character. Would the great men of earth assemble at Israel's capital to greet his coming? Would legions of angels present him to the expectant company? Notice, an angel visits the earth. Do you think the seven spirits directed the, this angel to visit the earth? To see who, were, who are prepared to welcome Jesus but he can discern no tokens of expectancy. He hears no voice of praise and triumph that the, that the period of Messiah's coming is at hand. The angel hovers for a time over the chosen city and the temple where the divine presence has been manifested for ages. So again, you see this angel, he's hovering for a time over the chosen city, and the temple where the divine presence has been manifested for ages. He's hovering, looking. Is there anyone down there who is prepared to welcome the Messiah? But even here is the same indifference. The priests in their pomp and pride are offering polluted sacrifices in the temple. The Pharisees are with loud voices addressing the people are making boastful prayers at the corners of the streets. In the palaces of kings, in the assemblies of philosophers, in the schools of the rabbis, all are alike unmindful of the wondrous fact which has filled all heaven with joy and praise that the Redeemer of men is about to appear upon the earth. Do you think we, we're, in the, we're in the same situation today? 
the leaders of the churches and the nations, they are unaware that the end of all things is at hand and the King of kings and Lord of lords is about to appear in the clouds of heaven. There is no evidence that Christ is expected and no preparation for the Prince of Life. In amazement, the celestial messenger is about to return to heaven with the shameful tidings when he discovers a group of shepherds who are watching their flocks by night. And as they gaze into the starry heavens are contemplating the, the prophecy of a Messiah to come to earth and longing for the advent of the world's Redeemer. Yeah, these are the ones that the eyes of the Lord are searching for. And it is the same today, dear people. The Holy Spirit is looking upon the earth for those that are contemplating the prophecy of the second coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds of heaven. That people that are longing for the second advent of the world's Redeemer. Here is a company that is prepared to receive the heavenly message, and suddenly the angel of the Lord appears, declaring the good tidings of great joy. Celestial glory floods all the plain. An innumerable company of angels is revealed, and as if the joy were too great for one messenger to bring from heaven, a multitude of voices break forth in the anthem which all the nations of the saved shall one day sing. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Oh, what a lesson is this wonderful story of Bethlehem. How it rebukes our unbelief, our pride and self-sufficiency. How it warns us to beware lest by our criminal indifference we also fail to discern the signs of the times and therefore know not the, the day of our visitation. It was not alone upon the hills of Judea, not among the lowly shepherds only that angels found the watchers for Messiah's coming. In the land of the heathen also were those that looked for him. They were wise men, rich and noble, the philosophers of the East. Students of nature, the Magi, had seen God in his handiwork. From the Hebrew scriptures, they had learned of the star to arise out of Jacob, and with eager desire they awaited his coming, who should be not only the consolation of Israel, but a light to lighten the Gentiles, and for salvation unto the ends of the earth. They were seekers for light, and light from the throne of God illumined the path for their feet. While the priests and rabbis of Jerusalem, the appointed guardians and expounders of the truth, were shrouded in darkness, the heaven-sent uh, heaven star guided these Gentile strangers to the birthplace of the newborn king. So these people, whether you're talking about the shepherd, you know, Mary and Joseph, you know, the shepherds on the hills of Bethlehem, they represent Seventh-day Adventists. I have no doubt about that. And these other people here, the Magi, they represent the people of the, of the world who don't have the same light that God's people do. Okay, both. God is looking for both of these people. It is unto them that look for him. I want to emphasize this. It is unto them that look for him that Christ is to appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So God is looking for them, and they are looking for him. Like the tidings of the Savior's birth, the message of the second advent was not committed to the religious leaders of the people. I believe it's the same today. The Millerite movement 
has been and it is being repeated right before our eyes in the church. They have failed to preserve their connection with God. The leaders in the Seventh-day Adventist Church have failed to preserve their connection with God and have refused. Yes, they have refused light from heaven. Therefore, they were not, they will, and, they, and in our day, they will not be of the number described by the Apostle Paul, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Ellen White here is speaking of the, the condition of the Protestant churches just before the great Second Advent movement, the Millerite movement, there in the late 1700s and early 1800s. But that is, is to be repeated and is being repeated in our day. The same condition as existed back then exists today. The watchmen, up, the watchmen upon the walls of Zion should have been the first to catch the tidings of the Savior's advent, the first to lift their voices to proclaim him near, the first to warn the people to prepare for his coming. You know, when I read this, dear people, when I read this, one of the things that comes to my mind is, you know, here in this home, in our mail, we get two Seventh-day Adventist periodicals every month. The, the, con the conference record, or the union record, I should say, and which is, you know, every conference, every, every union has a paper. And that union consists of, you know, you got like in the Arkansas, you have Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, I think all of those, and Louisiana. They all represent, they, they're all of, the, they're the Southwestern Union. And so we get the Southwestern Union record. And we also get the, the, uh, the paper that used to be called the, uh, you know, they used to send out the review years ago. Now it's the Adventist Journey, okay? It is pathetic. It is pathetic. The, the articles in, the, in, 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 the, in, in those magazines are pathetic. Why do, I, why do I say that now? Let me read it again. The watchmen of, upon the walls of Zion. Our leaders in the Adventist church are supposed to be uh, watchmen on the walls of Zion. Are they watching to warn the people? Not in the least. Not in the least. And they should have been, and they should be now, the first to catch the tidings of the Savior's advent. But in, instead, their messages are saying, My Lord delayeth his coming. The first to lift their voices to proclaim him near. The first to warn the people to prepare for his coming. That is mute. It is mute. They're dumb dogs that don't bark. But they were at ease, dreaming of peace and safety, while the people were asleep in their sins. Jesus saw his church like the barren fig tree covered with pretentious leaves, yet destitute of precious fruit. There was a boastful observance of the forms of religion, while the spirit of true humility Penitence and faith, which alone could render the service acceptable to God, was lacking. Instead of the graces of the Spirit, there were manifested pride, formalism, vain glory. Oh, vain glory, selfishness, and oppression. A backsliding church closed their eyes to the signs of the times. God did not forsake them or suffer his faithfulness to fail, but they departed from him and separated themselves from his love. As they refused to comply with the conditions, 
His promises were not fulfilled to them. Such is the sure result of neglect to appreciate and improve the, the, the light and privileges which God bestows. Unless the church will follow on in his opening providence, accepting every ray of light, performing every duty which may be revealed, religion will inevitably degenerate into the observance of forms, and the spirits of vital godliness will disappear. And that's exactly what has happened. This truth has been repeatedly illustrated in the history of the church over and over and over and over and over again. This truth has been repeated in the history of the church. God requires of his people works of faith and obedience corresponding to the blessings and privileges bestowed. Obedience requires a sacrifice and involves a cross, and this is why so many of the professed followers of Christ refused to receive the light from heaven and, like the Jews of old, knew not the time of their visitation. And God's people today, they do not know the time of their visitation because their leaders are not warning them. Because of their pride and unbelief, the Lord passed them by and revealed his truth to those who, like the shepherds of Bethlehem and the eastern magi, had given heed to all the light they had received. That's the facts. Are we giving heed to all the light we have received, like the shepherds of Bethlehem and the eastern magi? If we are, then God will reveal his truth to us. Oh, my. Well, brothers and sisters, if you agree with this presentation, then by all means tap that like button so that this video can be sent, this message can be sent out far and wide to those who are hungering for the bread of life and thirsting for the water of life. Uh, and uh, if you haven't subscribed, then by all means, we encourage you to subscribe to this channel. And uh, if you have any comments or questions, then by all means, uh, place them at the bottom of this video. Let us pray. Our great and holy Father in heaven, O oh Lord our God, we see that your Holy Spirit is going about all the earth, going to and fro, searching for those who, who are looking for light from thy word, those who are looking and expecting the soon coming of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to this world to bring all of this suffering and sin and rebellion to an end. Lord, we earnestly pray that you would help us to keep the word of your patience, that you may keep us from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them and dwell upon the earth. Please continue, O Lord, to guide us as we study the book of Revelation Help us, O Lord, to take heed to the sure word of prophecy. We pray and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.